I think it's um, the experience of so many adult people now who are out there making policy and are very interested in politics. I remember watching Desmond Tutu on television and thinking, why is he so angry? He just seems so angry to me. And this was probably actually when I was a little bit younger, maybe six or seven, when he was on television. And the depiction of him was just as someone who was just like feisty. And, and what was the problem? And I remember my mother, who is to this day extremely conservative Republican, saying, it's not fair what they do to those people over there. It's just not fair. This is a person who would never, for example, want to even imagine herself in a conversation with someone who would identify themselves as a communist or a radical or as a pan-Africanist. She went to Tuskegee, she got her degree, she moved back to Buffalo, New York, and she worked hard, and that's what she did, and she felt that everybody else should do that. But she really, there was something about it, there was something about that movement that even in the beginning really struck her. I think the next thing that I remember was the whole Coca-Cola band that went on in my house for a long time. And that, you know, obviously it annoyed me because everybody else was drinking Coca-Cola, and, and my, but my parents really took a hard line. When, when they would hear, even if it wasn't true, if they were here, if they heard that there was a corporation that needed to be boycotted, it was, that was the law in our house, just like you had to go to church at 8 a.m. You know, every Sunday. It was the law. That's what you did. Um, now, you know, looking back and running Trans Africa, it, it really makes me understand the power that the movement had. The, just the broad stroke, the broad ranging power that the movement had that would touch my life in Buffalo. Because by the time that Nelson Mandela was released from prison, we all sat around the television and watched. We all couldn't believe it. Even at 14, couldn't believe it. And, and for me, I think that that, that says something. And, and just to piggyback on what Bill said, I think it's so important that, you know, so often we look at people and we say, oh, armchair activist, or um, what do we call it now when people go on and they just click clicktivism. But yet, it's really the people like me, it's the 14-year-olds that you're trying to reach, because it taught me something else, too, which is that black folks could be involved in changing our government never occurred to me. When I started telling people, and very early I said, you know, I want to work on international stuff. People would always tell me, black folks don't do that. You can join the civil rights movement if you want, but black folks don't do that. Very clear to me it was possible because of the images that I saw. I guess the other thing I just want to mention, um, speaking to folks my age, you know, mid-30s to mid-40s, a few people have said this to me, and I never thought about it this way, but the passing of Nelson Mandela for us, in our age group, is the only thing, we don't know how folks felt back then, but the only thing that we can liken to the passing of a Malcolm X or a Martin Luther King, not in the way that it was so violent, but just the, the end of something. And the call that immediately, people feel like, okay, well, what do we do now? We have to step up, we have to do something. And so for our generation, I, I think that's quite profound. And, and lastly, I just want to say, I really had the, the honor and the privilege not being involved in the anti-apartheid struggle in any way, shape, or form, but through my um, institutional relationship, was able to co-chair what was called, or what is called, Celebration of the Life, Legacy, and Values of Nelson Mandela with Bill Lucy, who we all know was there and worked very hard with Sylvia to get arrested anywhere they could. Um, and and that, is, that has been a real honor and privilege. And I hope we can talk about how the memorials are really celebrations and calls to activism. Thank you. Um, well, I started out on this um, journey really around 69, but um, more intensely around 72. And there were former members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who were part of what was called the Center for Black Education, which was located here in DC. And um, we were organizing the Sixth Pan-African Congress, which followed the tradition of the W.E.B. Du Bois um, Congresses. And the Congress took place in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, for the first time on African soil, with the 
it's a long story about that, but I'm probably short. But the important point, and the reason why I'm giving you this context, is that it was in that at that Congress that we were able to have, first of all, on some way about 300 people of African descent. Uh, from the United States, but also from the uh, Pacific Islands, from um, Europe, and from the Caribbean, who um, got a chance to participate in that Congress. The national liberation movements, particularly for Limo of Mozambique and MPLA of Angola, uh, as well as the African National Congress, and the Pan African News Congress, and the um, South Sudan Zanu of uh, Zimbabwe pressed us to return to our homelands and to work on international solidarity with the national liberation movements. At the time, I lived in um, St. Paul, Minnesota and worked at McAllister College. And by the fall of 74, I had moved to Washington, back to Washington, D.C. Um, Sandra Hill, who was working in Tanzania, moved back to Washington, moved to Washington D.C., and a number of other people, Kathy Llewellyn, who had worked on the Congress. Uh, Cecily Counts came a little bit later because she was in school out of Stanford. But uh, Sandra Radley was here. But there were a number of us who uh, formed the Southern African News Collective out of several iterations. And we met every week to conceptualize how we would build people-to-people uh, -people ties between the people of Southern Africa, because we saw it as a regional issue, uh, with the people of the United States. But we also focused on how we would change U.S. foreign policy in the belly of the beast. And so let me just say that one feature of our strategy was that it had to be a grassroots movement. And there were many other organizational structures, and they were all important. For example, Trans-Africa was an important structure that really worked uh, with the, on the Hill. So did, um, to name is it, Washington Office on Africa. Uh, there were church sectors that worked around mobilizing church people. The, you know, labor was very important. The universities were very important for divestment, disinvestment, uh, local governments. But the point I want to make about this is that one aspect of this, the methodology of our work was to link the struggles. And so we were not simply having people perform acts of charity, but we were trying to show them that solidarity, right, would be our mode of work that would essentially um, make all of us gain. And one of the reasons why it was very important to work on the uh, Southern African region struggle is that you cannot be a respected people in your country if people who look like you are being decimated, violated, wherever they are in the world. And so it was within that political context that we functioned. And of course, you know, we had humanitarian concerns as well, and we had. Um, concerns that were essentially uh, even altruistic. But I think the political context is very important. And so just a little snippet. Um, it's also very important to understand that the strength of our capacity was a product of what was happening internally to South Africa. Right? We didn't just do something. There was a movement going on internally. And uh, South Africa itself also had external representation of those who were in exile, and they were very important to enabling us to really depict what we had never seen, because none of us had ever been to South Africa. Um, 
The other point I would make is that one of the observations about this, the Free South Africa movement is that we had young people who were kind of first time employees on the Hill who worked in various Congress people and Senate offices. But I, I always like to point out them because they took their jobs very seriously. They did not just go to work and be a bum, right? They really studied how Congress worked. And they studied the movement of ideas and papers and policies and which congressmen were a little shaky and maybe could be persuaded and who couldn't. And so they were like the eyes and ears of the, for us, for the internal movement. And so, you know, people like Audrey Wood Dunn, um, Jackie Parker, who was one of the first black folks in the Senate, uh, they were all very, very important. And I like to point them out because I think that our capacity would have been much harder without people like that looking at the internal. And then, of course, the other observation is the, the, people, the ordinary people who simply wanted to express their opposition to apartheid. And when we first did the act of civil disobedience, we thought we could have demonstrations for about two weeks. That's what we were counting on to make our big glass. And in the second week, uh, organizations start calling and people start coming. And people said, well, my organization, the Black Social Workers, wants to come and express our opposition of the Black Psychologists or the Metropolitan Church, or, you know, the various universities. And so the other point I want to make is while the actual arrest was symbolic, and of course it had no level of brutality as uh, young people experienced in the South or young people experienced in the North as individuals not even doing anything political, just being black, right? It had none of that. But it had political symbolism. And it gave ordinary people a way to express their opposition uh, to a foreign policy of constructive engagement. And it gave them a way to visibly say, I want no part of this. Because it was public and visible, it made it more difficult for political operatives to say, well, I support white supremacy. <laughs> You know, some did say it, but it made it more difficult for a number of others. And so therefore, um, you began to see uh, some of them pulling back and going forward and pulling back. So I'll stop there and put you on Okay. Brilliant, brilliant analysis. Coke sweetens the apartheid. Remember that? Y'all remember that? Coke sweetens the apartheid. We didn't do South African lives today. The Cougar Rants. The Cougar Rants. There were so many things that were out there that we were, that so many people were engaged in. Uh, and again, it was broad because we also didn't, you know, we didn't, you know, back in those days, uh, we weren't beyond, at least I wasn't. And now, you know, I don't drink anymore, but I did in those days. And I did up in those days to ask me for a lifetime. Lance's rose was off the table. <laughs> All, all those wines were off the table. We took that serious in those days. I mean, there were all kinds of things that were really being worked out. James Early, I want you to take a minute or so or to sort of set the table in this regard. Because I mentioned the fact that each of these struggles, and we said we could spend time just going through what happened in the South, because we were very focused on Southern Africa, and then there was also in the South and, and Cape Verde and the South. But the struggle in South Africa, I wish we'd just take a minute to just sort of let us know what the nature of the movement was. What was ANC and the other one? What were they up against? What was the kind of the context? Because in some ways to talk about what the outcome was in terms of the settlement without laying that table might not be a fair thing. So I'd like to have you spend a few minutes, if you would, just to let us know what the lay of the land was in South Africa. Well, 
to talk about white supremacy at a really systemic national scale um, uh, brutal oppression of the majority population um, is what South Africa was about in terms of its racial supremacy. But I also think you have to root it in the fact, particularly in looking at the situation in South Africa today, uh, that we're talking about an economic system uh, called capitalism, which is in its neoliberal expression today, which we no doubt will talk about. Uh, that's a fact. That's not an ideological fact. When people hear that, particularly coming from activists, people get a little nervous and say, well, I don't want to be in But that's the system that they lived in in terms of economics. And then it had this absolutist white supremacist overlay of that. That's one. Secondly, the internal struggle for power, for freedom, the freedom struggle for black people to, and other people of color to run that country and to express themselves was tied to what we call the frontline states. Sylvia has uh, referenced and, uh, and Bill referenced a, a number of the liberation organizations in the frontline states. So that the South African internal struggle relied on support throughout, directly throughout the region. And of course, the white supremacist government also extended uh, its tentacles uh, into that area. So there was a particular kind of, of solidarity that went on. And so when we, when we look at uh, the liberation of South Africa, it is fundamentally tied to the liberation of these, these, uh, these other, other areas. Um, I will just sort of stop here to say that, because uh, we'll get to this later, I think the implications for that today is not only to look within South Africa, the unfinished struggle, uh, and to look within the frontline states. I'm just coming out of Angola. Uh, Luanda is the uh, most expensive city in the world. Uh, it is the home of the uh, richest African woman in the world who was in her 40s, who was uh, the daughter of the Marxist uh, president there. A lot of, yeah, Du Santos, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of contradictions here. But the implications go beyond Africa because the regional dynamic in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we have representatives from the Cuban intersection city tonight that I hope uh, you all get a chance to meet. The most dynamic area in the world today taking up the struggle against neoliberal capitalism uh, in various forms uh, is, is something that, that we, should, we should think about. I want to ask anybody else if they would like to just fill in any thoughts about the, the nature of uh, and again, I, I say this because I'm aware that there are people who may be viewing and who are even in the audience who don't have a sense about the Bantu stance, who don't have a sense about the proportion of the numbers of the white minority was versus the black majority, the nature of, you know, armed struggle versus nonviolent resistance, and some of those kinds of questions. I just want to fill that in a little bit. And U.S. complicity in that, the 300 or so right. corporations, the Smithsonian Institution. So if anybody else would one like of this, them. Uh, at, at, yeah, anybody else want to just fill in? Well, you know, I think you laid it out. I think it's it's really critical for people to understand the, the numbers, right? So you had minority whites um, basically controlling everything. So, you know, people say 10% controlling 90% of the wealth, but many of us feel like, I mean, it, it was probably 2%. <laughs> you know, even smaller. Are you only, I'm sorry, are you all able to hear me? Is that better? Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, you know, so, but, but because this minority kind of wrested control back, and it goes back to the late 1800s, right? I mean, wresting control of political power and of economic power and using violence, using violence, that's the other critical point, um, to, to maintain this structure of separation, so the apartheid, keeping the races apart, separated from each other with the sense that blacks were inferior, you know, and, and whites were superior. So, you know, we can trace it all the way back. I mean, I don't know if we have time to go through all of that, but, but you know, um, in terms of some of the origins of it. But those who migrated from Europe into Southern Africa had this very racist notion of the world, the same racist notion that underpins slavery in the United States, we have to say. <laughs> um, 
also um, found its footing in, in, in Southern Africa. But it, I think it is the violent means through which the means of production were being controlled. So blacks being subjugated to these Bantu stands, really inferior lands um, for farming, inferior lands in terms of access to any kind of resources, and, and maintaining a structure whereby the workers in those Bantu stands had to have passes, essentially, um, that were sanctioned by the white rulers to be able to even move throughout the country, throughout their own country. Right? So to get to work, you had to take transportation, you had to show your, your pass, your identity pass. Um, otherwise, you would be imprisoned, you would be beaten, you could lose your life. Um, so I think it is the extreme use of violence to maintain a, a structure of economic dominance um, that, that so um, uh, characterized the, 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 the racist apartheid regime. And I think it is really critical to underscore when we talk about those companies, it, you know, the passes were being made. Um, I went to, my mother lived in Rochester, New York, right? I'll say New York, Kodak. Why were, were we boycotting Kodak? Because Kodak was producing the passes, right? IBM was, had a role in sustaining these, these companies, you know, Shell Oil, had a role in sustaining this, this, um, this structure that, that oppressed, that killed, that violated human dignity. And that, I think, is, is you know, again, just to, to give a bit more of the flavor. Yeah, what I want to add is um, emphasizing that South Africa was a settler state. And, and I say that because there are people that look at South Africa, and, and we're seeing this in a lot of the discussions now around Mandela, and they, they treat it as if it was completely exceptional, like there was no other planet a uh, country on this planet that was a settler state. Um, and it was, it was that unique, but the United States is a settler state. Algeria was a settler state. Uh, uh, what is now Zimbabwe was a settler state. Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and Northern Ireland. And there's a pattern. And you can see it play out in different ways, the way that this works. In terms of, it's not simply colonization. It's where a settler population moves in and it either intends to exterminate the existing population or remove them. We're seeing this in Israel with what's happening to the Palestinians. It's like, it's, it's, you know, there's usually in a settler state some communication allegedly between God and the settler. And God allegedly tells the settler, well, you can take this land. Right? Now, the, the people living there don't hear that same voice. Right? <laughs> The, 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 the settler interprets whatever they hear, the stack that they hear as justification for this. And so I think what we saw in South Africa was a manifestation of that. And I, I mentioned Algeria because Algeria was a national liberation war against a settler state that was set up by the French that was in many ways very similar in terms of what happened to the Algerian population. And Algeria and a number of other countries play a major role in helping the anti-apartheid movement, the national liberation movement in South Africa, including training the soldiers that had actually fought against the apartheid regime. Just following on two points made, three. Uh, you know, the thing about any um, colonial state, settler, uh, state is that the point that Emile Cockabral, who uh, was a Cape Verdean revolutionary uh, leader of PAIGC that was assassinated by the Portuguese, one of his points was that it usurps your history because you now are responding to this foreign imposition of domination and, and dehumanization. And so your whole history gets distorted as you deal with it. And that the national liberation movement, the armed struggle, is an opportunity to reclaim history. And so it's in that framework I would like for you to see uh, why armed struggle was necessary, um, principally because there were not avenues for political struggle, though they had been tried. And that the armed struggle was one phase, not the only phase, 
was recognized that there would come a point when you would need a political phase of struggle as well. Now I'd like to shift to the, the nature of what happened. In this. Those of us on this part, by and large, we were interested in black majority group. I mean, that was kind of how we saw it. We, we were talking about black majority group because this white minority controlled everything and we wanted to be black majority group. It's interesting that both of the, was it P.W., whatever his name, both of and Mandela received the Nobel Peace Prize. And that leads me to the question of what happened. What is the nature of the agreement which led to a black majority group? And I say that because in some ways to ask that question will lead us to the next question of what is the nature of the outcome. James, I'm going to ask you to take the lead again on that one. Um, it was a uh, clerk. And underneath that arrangement of recognizing both of these men um, is a, an arrangement about political power. Uh, because that was the fundamental question. Who is going to control the democratic development based on the majority and what will be the social arrangement and what will be the economic arrangement? So that uh, this negotiation that brings uh, world attention to these two men uh, actually obscures the fact that the economic relationship did not change. Um, now, there are a number of other factors that are positive factors in that. One has to do with solidarity. We have to recognize that it is Cuba coming in at the invitation uh, of the African National Congress and the Angolan military that defeats the South Africans uh, that sets the table for the white supremacists in South Africa and their Western allies, including the government and corporations of the United States of America, to say, we just entered a new phase here. Uh, because the armed struggle that started, I guess, around 1960 with Mbutu uh, Sizwe, uh, with uh, the ANC and the South African Communist Party, with Mandela, who was then a member of the Central Committee of the South African Communist Party, as well as Vida and ANC, with Joe Slovo, a uh, Eastern European Jew communist who was involved in that. So that the West and the, and the, the white supremacists started to say, this new struggle is something that uh, we don't think we're prepared for. So they made a dramatic a strategic move to try to come to some levels of compromise. And that compromise is what we are actually left with uh, today. Uh, that compromise broke with the Freedom Charter of uh, the African National Congress that had called not only for political power for the black majority, but for a radical transformation, redistribution of the economic system towards the minority population. Um, that compromise left principles in the uh, white supremacist economic setup and the banking arrangement in power. Um, I was reading something today about nuclear uh, weapons. You know, it was uh, with the Israelis and the British and with uh, the, the support of the U.S. that uh, uh, nuclear weapons were developed in South Africa. And, I, and this is a very tricky and important point. As I was reading this article today. So South Africa was the only country to hold, have a nuclear weapon. And the, and the, and the, the practical implications of having, on the continent, the practical implications of that, as this article definitely pointed out, was it sets the basis for a deeper political negotiation. It gives you more leverage to extract more of, uh, of, of what you want. So um, this is what we are left with in many ways today, is that we have political power, uh, as we've got political power in this city, but we don't have economic power. No, but I just want to back up one little topic, because I, this is just a little bit of a context. Uh, the rationale for constructive engagement was that um, <clears throat> that the ANC would be a pawn of the Soviet Union. And so the United States always justified 
is support of the white supremacist regime of South Africa based on a kind of anti-communist framework. When this act of civil disobedience occurred at the South African embassy with African Americans, principally um, the first people getting arrested, Mary Frances Berry, Congressman Walter Fontro, and Randall Robinson, it reframed the debate because it placed it in a race context. And when you look at the responses during that period in the uh, newspapers and Congress people, I mean, in fact, a set of Congress people wrote Reagan, Republican Congress people wrote Reagan and said they didn't want to be identified with a racist government because they had constituents that would not want to see them. So it did change the debate. You know, it wasn't for long, it's nothing to do for long in the United States, right? So that's one context. And the other context I want to just point out, and I'm putting this out because it really is an example of why civic engagement is so important, why public display of opposition is so important. When Nelson Mandela was released from prison, there was a furor of um, the question of whether blacks would kill whites, uh, whether black violence was so bad between each other they could not govern, who could leave the country. And actually, F.W. de Klerk was being kind of postured as a white man of goodwill who could make this ultimate transition. The African National Congress came to uh, Howard Belafonte and asked if we could organize a visit for Nelson Mandela to the United States. And of course, he was going to visit 11 or 12 other countries. But the whole strategy behind that was to give Mandela an international image as a leader and to make it very clear that he was the only leader that would be accepted by the world. And so it was key within all these locales that we had very large popular turnouts. And if those of you who might have been here in the United States know that we had very large popular turnouts for his 10-day visit here. And that was to establish his position. Yeah. And he was very clear, though people attempt uh, sometimes to just make him a person, glorified individual. But I traveled with him for 10 days. And one thing that was very clear about him, he was a very disciplined person. He worked in the collective. He understood when to be the individual leader and when to be the collective leader. And I saw that in all kinds of circumstances. So, so we can, mm -hmm. Some say that there was a debate in the African National Congress um, between those who said we should not make the settlement in the way that we're making it, and that Mandela actually overrode that um, and made that decision. And there's no question that while racializing the struggle was an advance to draw a mass organization, uh, it really obscured the political, the, the unchanged political relationship. Is that, are you aware of any of those internal debates? And it, this is not a question about Mandela versus John X or Susan Doe, but it's about what the political arrangement. I, you know, there were debates, obviously. Um, and it, to some extent, your perspective is based on how you see the internal power centers, historical moment, and what you view as your power base in order to make change in a very complex society. You know, it would be like assuming state power of the United States now. And, you know, you don't even know where all the things are hidden, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you're assuming management of something that every day and every moment you find out, oh, I didn't know that exists. I do see President Obama experiencing that. Oh, I never thought of that. Right. So there were those kind of, I mean, you know, I do think you have to appreciate, and I'm not um, 
an apologist for that. But I do think you have to appreciate the moment. And you have to appreciate the problem that most of the people who were going to be assuming state power had been outside of South Africa, in exile, right? And that the young people who were inside, who had been the United Democratic Front, had been basically the organizers and pushing forward change. Uh, so to some extent, a lot of the debate was among people who had theory of how to make change, but had had no formal experience of even working in a bureaucracy. You know? I, I just wanted to, to mention this, because I've had an opportunity in the last year or so to sit and just listen to conversations of people that were in South Africa at the time, who were there working on, on these issues. And, and two things always rise to the top of the conversation. The one is, no one suspected that the Soviet Union would shift the way it did when it did. So a lot of the suggestions on how the economic policies were going to be reformed, I mean, you had Mandela saying that he wanted to nationalize major, major industries. There's no backup for that. Uh, it, just to speak plainly about it, there was just there was no backup for that sort of move. And I think that, you know, with the with the hindsight we have now, it seems like oh, an opportunity was missed. But you know, one of the things that Ambassador Rasul was talking about a couple months ago is, you know, when you were in South Africa, you knew that the white power structure was behind most of the killings, most of the violence, most of the attacks. People were being killed on a daily basis in massacres. That was a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure and not a lot of way out. So again, not to apologize because I think that there's, there's a lot that needs to be done. But I think, you know, it, we have to think about it that way and explore what people were really going through at the time that these economic um, compromises, if you will, were made because we encounter those every single day around the world. When we look at countries in Latin America that are dealing with trade deals and don't know which way to turn and people are being massacred and there's no jobs and there's this and that, people are, have to make those decisions. So I just think it's important to think about it that way because we either have to shift the paradigm or figure out a way to live within it. I don't want to live within it, but I think it has to be discussed that way. If you really want to, if I could just, wait, yeah, I, I don't think that we should think about any apologetic perspectives here, but I do think that we need to look at uh, how things actually unfold. So by making the compromise at that level, and then they kill Chris Hani. Many believe that Chris Hani, who was uh, head of the Communist Party, would, was so popular that he actually may have become the first president. And so once that happens, you know, what, is think, what is the thinking, this is a rhetorical question, inside uh, the, the, the ANC? Because these are the lessons that we have to extract now as we look at the hard decisions that are being made in places like Bolivia and in Venezuela, where they know that if they force a deeper compromise, they're going to get a stronger reaction from the status quo. And this is what would have happened in South Africa. Uh, it would not have been as liberally democratic as it emerged because the system would have put much, much more pressure, including the United States government and uh, the West. Uh, yeah, I want to actually build on, on something that Nicole was raising and, you know, uh, push the envelope. Within the ANC, it was class struggle. I mean, it wasn't like they were a monolithic block and everything was hunky dory, and then 1909 comes in and everything starts unraveling. There was class struggle all along the line. And a, a, a feature of this is that the South African Communist Party was one of the most dogmatic pro-Soviet parties on the planet. They had a very, dip, very dogmatic view of what building socialism was, and it was a Soviet model, pure and simple. And when things start to unravel in the Soviet Union, then there's an opening in, uh, uh, space that ends up within the SACP for broader discussion, but there was also a level of disarray. People like Becky leaves the SACP and starts moving increasingly rightward. Uh, and, and, and this shouldn't surprise us because we've seen it in our own world. When, when uh, at certain points, when struggle uh, sort of declines or we lose key leaders and then people start to become very confused 
and, and some of the issues of class start to emerge. And you start to see that people's objectives in the movement were not necessarily as pure as we might have thought at one point, uh, that they had other objectives. And, and so this issue of class struggle, I think, is something we've got to really look at. Because it's not simply that the Soviets disappeared and that there was a failure of backing up. The model was gone. And in the absence of that model, there were other models that came in. When you have someone like in Becky, who was in the SACP, at one point saying that he is a Thatcherite. I mean, how, how in the name of Marx, Lenin, Mumba, and everybody else, could you possibly say, I'm a Thatcherite in South Africa? It was, it was, it was clearly um, indicating the class stand that he had adopted. And it wasn't just in Becky. Even though when Becky was removed, there were a whole set of other people who had become incredibly wealthy um, and while there's great impoverishment in the country. So I think we have to understand it's not, it, it, again, it's not just about what Mandela was thinking. There was a struggle that was going on in the ANC, and it was also reflected in other movements within South Africa, and they played, them out, they played itself out in a certain way, which has included the encouraging and this is going to sound familiar, of the demobilization of the popular movements, of the over-reliance on what people will do once they get in office, of, of, of saying, we, you know us, you can trust us, right? And we know where that takes us. Comments over here before we shift. Well, let's get a mirror first. You know, I just wanted to say the counterpart to what what um, Will so beautifully said and, and, and Nicole, you know, in addition to the the you know sort of collapse of the of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, on this end, the Washington Consensus, however you describe it, neoliberalism was gaining strength, was gaining ground. So I think it's really critical for us to understand that broader global context, right? So these Bretton Woods Institute, World Bank, um, IMF, you know, they find ways to entrench themselves, and they were fully entrenched. And so what many call this grand bargain that the South African government made is an economic model that was adopted, pushed by the World Bank and IMF to say, you must privatize your industries. You must have you know, certain constraints on capital controls and all of these measures that you know could have helped bring things in a different direction for workers, bring things in a different direction in terms of national rights and over resources. Um, so I, I just want us to kind of keep that parallel because we're sitting here in Washington, the belly of the beast, right? Keep that parallel in mind. Um, that, that, that that's a critical. Thing. Yeah. Uh, no, I just I just want to uh, add to to some of Bill's comments. Uh, you know, you know the, the the model of the Soviet Union that the ANC and the South African Communist Party so was so closely wedded to was essentially a flawed model, right? It, it was a model uh, uh, filled with its own contradictions. The Soviet Union uh, lost the Cold War not so much because of the pressures of U.S. imperialism and, and, and the ability of the United States to outspend them in the arms race. That's, that, those are all important factors. But this was a model that also imploded on itself, right, by the sheer weight of its own internal contradictions. Right? And so, so this model was not one, unfortunately, the Cubans understood this very well. And so when, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed and and, and, and the aid from the Soviet Union to, 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 towards Cuba uh, uh, suddenly disappeared. The Cubans, nonetheless, had to find a way, and they did find a way, under tremendous sacrifice, to uh, continue with their revolutionary process. All right. So I just wanted to, to, to reinforce that point. But I, I want to just be very a little bit provocative here, and 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 ask all of us and the panel. In particular, uh, the fundamental question that I think we must uh, ask ourselves, it's a question that is troubling, it's disturbing, and, and a lot of people want to uh, not address it or, or sweep it under the rug, and, and it is this, it is 
why after 20 years, why 20 years after South Africa elected Nelson Mandela to be his first democratically elected president, and his first black president, uh, and which led to the destruction of the legal system of apartheid, why is it that in a country that is one of the richest in the continent, if not in the world, in terms of both natural resources and human resources, that today South Africa is considered the most unequal society in the world? That is a fundamental question that we can and should not avoid confronting. Uh, uh, why is it that white economic growth and privilege among white South Africans has increased almost exponentially in the last 20 years, right, has been consolidated. The white population of South Africa today, per capita, their per capita income, is one of the highest of any white populations in the world, right? And, 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 and millions and millions, 94, almost 90% of Africans in South Africa live today in uh, conditions of, of, of impoverishment. So while the ENC revolution was able to achieve the tremendous victory of dismantling at the legal level the systems of, of, of separation of the, of, of, of the races, the economic structures of apartheid remain intact today. And so as we look forward to what, what, what does the future hold for South Africa, that is, I think, a question that has to be central to all of our discussions moving forward. And we're going to go through that discussion. Before we do that, I just want to recognize that we do have in the audience Alexander B. Rodriguez Salazar, second secretary for the Cuban intersection. Would you please welcome him to the conversation? <laughs> now let's now do move to those questions because I think, and let me say it this way. A year or so ago, I picked up the paper and then I also saw television reports a number of miners who were gunned down ostensibly by forces representing the government. And I said to myself, this is like a Wilson Good bomb move moment. Why do I say that? Because when that happened within the context of the black consciousness aspect of our movement in this country, when that happened, we, we almost didn't know what to say. It was not Rizzo, many, many, many of you don't know who Rizzo was. Rizzo was one of the most ruthless, <coughs> vicious police chiefs, and we were all over Rizzo. But when it happened with Moo, with, with, with uh, Wilson Good, it was like, uh-oh. And there was not a whole lot to say about it. And it caused grave concern. There also the, the kind of data that Don has laid out. As well as, you know, I think they have something, what do they call it, the black diamonds or the black gems in South Africa now? I mean, one of the heroes of the movement in our day was Cyril Ramaphosa. He was like, oh man, Cyril was like, today he is one of the wealthiest men in South Africa. Million, right? So now let us do talk about that part of the, of the discussion. Let's answer the question, why is that so? But as we do, let's transition also in terms of what we think ought to be some prescriptions as we relate to the struggle in South Africa so we can then get to our audience. Well, I would say, first of all, it's been 20 years. And so we have to think of this as a long-term struggle. And you have to think about how long it's taken us to get to a little point. And we still haven't achieved economic equality. You know, or um, any um, equity of representation. Now, having said that, I think what we have to look for, both inside and outside, are, are the elements of social change possible. What are the strengths that maybe could carry this forward? One advantage I see, I think, is that there are enough young people, young adults and young people, who experience both apartheid and an anti-apartheid struggle to perhaps have a vision to be in opposition of this trend of materialism, opportunism, and exploitation and violence. 
the question, you know, of course, is how did they organize themselves and what solidarity uh, they have externally, which brings us, brings me to our point, and that is how well are we going to be organized? The internal struggle of South Africa and the region has its own motion of history. We have to be prepared that when it emerges in some strong character, we have linkages to it and we are able to um, stalemate our imperialist power uh, and you know the various operatives who operate in its interest. And I really think there's some things internal to the United States that we need to start looking at and we need to really think and have on our agenda that we have to have an on-the-ground movement. Uh, first of all, it's been 29 years, be 30 years since that activism took place, and that set of people are growing older. Um, we have a large, new, recently arrived population with a variety of different constituency interests, um, back home and as well as you know, internal here. So to what extent are we engaging them and are they aware of this agenda? Uh, we have a region that also um, is growing in its appetite for transformative change and for progressive government you know, in South America, Caribbean. And so uh, while there may be <coughs> constituencies here, to what extent do they feel empowered uh, to be in solidarity with those movements? So it's those kinds of things I think we really have to focus on because one of the things that sometimes frighten me is that people in the goodness of trying to be left and progressive and organizers can be as imperialistic as an imperialist government because they can assume that they can make somebody else's struggle and that you cannot do. I, I, I've been going, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I just want to build on that a little bit um, and go back to a part of the original question. Um, after law school, I moved to South Africa and I worked um, with communities that lived around the sulfur mines and worked on sulfur dioxide contamination issues where babies suffocated to death in their cribs because De Beers and others decided to let plumes burn whenever they felt like it. Um, when the Makarno massacre happened, it, it hit me personally because I, I knew those people, I knew what their lives were like, I knew how difficult it was to organize after working 14 hours in a mine and not having enough money to feed your kids. And I knew how difficult that must have been. I saw it a little bit differently, Ron. I was um, impressed that before I could even pick up the phone, um, many of the Free South Africa movement stalwarts were on my phone saying, uh, what are we going to do? Where's the letter? And we actually, uh, I know Trans Africa did a lot of work um, with the exact people. Sylvia was a signer, I believe Bill signed, uh, Randall Robinson signed, to say to President Zuma, hey, if you will, we were with you, but this is not all right. This is not okay, and these are the things we want to see happen. And certainly not all the things we asked to see happen happened. Um, some of them have, but it's something, I, I think that there, that was a pivot moment for people to say, yep, we were with you, we did everything we could, but we're not going to be with you if, this is, if these are the sorts of things we're going um, to see again. I also wanted to build on something that Sylvia was talking about, and I want to be really clear because I know that these folks are going to talk eloquently about some other issues, but I, I just want to raise this in this room. Let's, let's not pretend we were all so pure, because as I said, and as everybody said, Free South Africa movement had a wide range, and I can just tell you from my own experience living in South Africa, there were a lot of our folks over there, and they all were. Free South Africa movement people, and many of them were making a ton of money. Many of them literally said to me, on the backs of these Africans. Not all of us. Many of us, yes, we were in it because we, we thought like, you know, Sylvia tells the story about being at the March on Washington and thinking, 
you know, I should really work on international issues. Some of us started there and are, and are in it, and others saw an opportunity. What does that do to a solidarity movement when the folks that pick up their bags and move over there are the folks that may not be in it for solidarity reasons? And so I just think that we really need to be very clear because there, there are ways in which the communities in South Africa don't have the ties that they used to have to the African American community. And that's on them, and it's on us. Um, I've been going to South Africa since about 99, once or twice a year. And uh, had, had some, um, some sort of privileged relations in the last several years. Uh, being invited by the African National Congress to be involved in uh, the uh, African Union's meetings and, and the like. And, and in that regard, I think we have to take a steely-eyed view of what's going on in South Africa. Uh, for black people in particular, we are in this divide of pride over progress. Um, and so we should be prideful of the progress that a black man in the White House <laughs> represents because we know that is a single example of a social movement of breaking the history of American apartheid. <coughs> but if we just stick with pride, and this is one of the things we saw in the Free South Africa movement here in the United States. Black people from across the ideological spectrum as well as white people from across the ideological spectrum. Because of the horrendous, inhuman, immoral nature of apartheid, were able to come together. But when the that was resolved and the economic issues arose, as Nicole pointed out, people went in many directions. So there are a lot of black people in South Africa who are feeding uh, at, the, at, at the top of the system and off the back of this continued impoverishment uh, of, of black and, and other people of color in South Africa. So we need to take a steely look and I think specifically we need to look at the internal battles going on in the African National Congress, which is the African National Congress, the Coalition of Trade Unions, Flatu, uh, the South African Communist Party, and there will be other organizations. Now, right now, their common line seems to be they have some deep splits among themselves, but they feel they must stay in unity because there are really other no alternatives. I think the implications for solidarity is that we need now to identify and reconnect with whatever we individually or collectively feel are the most progressive parties on the ground. And it's got to be done in very concrete ways because the history of, uh, of, uh, of anti-racist and anti-capitalist movements uh, in South Africa in particular has always been a struggle of those who wanted to fight against racism and those who wanted to fight against class and those who wanted to fight against racism and class within the black community. Look at a book by Hakim Adi out of uh, London, uh, a Afro-descendant, Pan-Africanism and the International Communist Movement, 1913 to 1936 or something. Some very interesting stories, including the Communist Party in Cuba and this question of race and class in Cuba pre-1959. So we, we have some serious inquiry to make. And we have to also recognize that if the South Africans move in either a social democratic way or even a more dramatic radical way, the West is going to put a lot of pressure on them. Uh, there is no voluntarism that they can just say, well, we're going to make this decision. And it's simple. It's not going to be simple. When you look at what has come out of the discussions um, about, about the African Union, um, all of those projects are in the World Bank. All five of the projects that were decided on are in the World Bank. They're not in the Bank of the South with Brazil, or they're not, you know, um, or, 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 or Venezuela, or, or uh, the new, uh, America Sul. Uh, they made the same kind of, of, um, of uh, compromise. Compromise there, and so studying where are the progressive movements and making those alliances is, is uh, I think, imminent uh, of, 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 of priority for us to take. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I actually, uh, while I agree with the uh, the point that Nicole was making about the, the Trans Africa response around the Marikana murders, 
I actually want to pick up on what you were raising. Um, because it, there's really broad implications. The, um, when, when the Rwanda genocide went down, there were very few African Americans that spoke up. Very few. We acted embarrassed. We acted like, we're, you know, this is not something we can comment on. At the time, I said that if 100 Belgian paratroopers had gone to Kigali and killed 1,000 Rwandese, we would have burned down the embassy of Belgium. But a million people were murdered in, what, 90 days? And most of us just remained silent, right? And so what you're describing is part of a larger phenomenon. It's like, it's when you look at the world simply through the eyes of prism of race, then when the situation becomes more complicated, then you become silent, right? You become paralyzed. And I think we have to understand that that's something we absolutely have to break from. Uh, Second thing it is, it, and, and, and as such, we can fall prey to cynicism. There's this real tendency when things like uh, what we saw in Rwanda or in South Africa for people to say, oh, black folks can't, you know, you know how that goes. And, and that we become cynical and assume that no matter what happens, that it's never going to work out and it's completely hopeless, as opposed to looking at the dynamics of the situation. What South Africa is going through is not unique. Just like the settler state wasn't unique, the, post, uh, the post-apartheid situation shares much in common with what happened in Egypt after Nasser died, with what happened in Algeria after Boumedia, with what happened in Ghana after with, with Rollins, that, that there are certain kinds of national struggles that are taken to a certain point, and if they're not pushed even further, the, the undertow just pulls back towards the empire, and it, it becomes almost irresistible. It just pulls you back into the surf. And so what we're looking at there is not just a problem in South Africa. It's that without, within all of these countries, the, the certain model has fractured. And now the question is, in this early part of the 21st century, is what next? And I think what we're seeing in South Africa right now is uh, to build on what James was raising, is that indeed the struggle continues. And that the alliance that, uh, that brought forward the end of apartheid has fragmented. I don't think you put Humpty Dumpty back together. I think that it's moving into another stage. And it's not clear what that stage is. But just today, the National Union of, Mine, of Metal Workers in South Africa, uh, uh, no, Metal Workers, said the alliance is over. That we, that we call on Kosatu to pull out of the alliance. This is NUMSA, not the National Union of Mine Workers, the, uh, the, uh, the metal workers. So we call on Kosatu to pull out of the alliance. This is historic. Where it goes, it, it becomes an open question. I absolutely wanted to jump in on that because I, I think Bill is, is right on point. Um, where it goes is the open question, and today I, I feel like it's, it's extraordinary because not only did they say they're, they're threatening to pull out of Kostatu, but they also said, you know, this dec they put out a declaration, like a five phase declaration, <laughs> and chief in those phases is privatization. They're going to the core, the root of the problem, which is that, you know, the 1%, I know in this room, people, so many people were part of the Occupy movement. And to me, you know, the economists, the economists say GD coefficient and all of that. But the Occupy folks hit the nail on the head. The 1% versus the 99%. And what these workers are saying in this declaration is that we are the 99% and we are demanding controls on corporate power. So what they're pushing is, is I think, what many within, you know, again, sort of a, a fractured ANC, but, but the ones that many of us held up as, as, as kind of heroes, what they were pushing, which is state control to, to whatever extent possible of these vital natural resources. Remember, South Africa has diamonds, has gold, has platinum. The list is too long to go, right? And, and now, now add oil and so many other resources that are still just being developed. So what you have is now a very powerful union saying, we don't think so, and demanding 
demanding an end to the status quo. And they actually put out, February 26th, I think is the date, they put out a date for a national strike. I think that is phenomenal, right? Because not only are they laying down the land and you know, just say, this is what must happen, but they're saying, we're going to take our, I think it's a million five. Bill probably has a figure on top of his head. But it's over a million people to the streets, and this is the date. Right. So I think it is reclaiming agency. It is reclaiming the space where workers are saying we must have a different system. And you know, I, and I guess I just I, I'm extremely hopeful because I do think we're in this moment where in the last three years, you know, a lot of attention has been played on Tunisia and, and on Egypt. But in 22 African countries, there have been uprisings, including. Swaziland, you know, the only remaining monarchy on the continent where there was an occupied Swazi. So I believe actually that young people are, are in a different space where the status quo is not acceptable. And increasingly you are now having workers in a different space where, you know, they can't put food on the table, they can't have housing. You know, the, the, the promises of, of liberation haven't borne out um, for them in their daily lives. So I do think that, um, that it is extraordinary what, what's coming out of South Africa, and it's not just there. You know, the Nigerian um, oil sector workers, also, this week, I don't know what's going on this week. I think everybody's holding on this legacy of Mandela and, and being inspired to, to find their voice and to, and to take their activism to a higher level. But the Nigerian war workers are also calling for a strike. We've got to see where this is all going. But I think it is important for us, as part of the international solidarity movement, to understand that folks are standing up to say, uh-uh, we don't think so, and to demand um, that people continue to, to to take agency, to take um, organizing more seriously, and to use whatever leaders they have to challenge the status quo. Okay, we're going to now go to our audience. I see. Uh... Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I'm asking people to look back. And, and, and you probably will not be able to do this quite so much, for quite so much and, and I guess look forward to. But nobody has mentioned Wynne Mandel. And um, I remember when she came here with Nelson, and I was at the convention center with my eight-year-old son, and I remember Mandela getting up to speak. And after he sat down, the crowd said, Winnie, Winnie, you remember that, Sylvia? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, and so she, is, she was a power. And maybe if they had stayed together, for what you know, maybe some other things might have happened. I don't know. But I mean, that, that, is, that, is, that is something to think about. And the other thing is, I do believe that Nelson Mandela's, I, I believe they kept him alive so that things would not blow up. Um, so, anyway. All right, so, the, so we're going to take a couple of this. One is the role and legacy of uh, Wayne Mandela. Uh, let's go over here. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your comments. Uh, my question is, um, in light of the February 26th um, strike, and Miss um, Hilly spoke about making the linkages to the struggles here and there, what do you see as the opportunity for us to link here with what's happening in South Africa? What what is what what, what could be created between now and then? Okay, I'm gonna go back to the back here. I saw let's get a brother and I took some sisters delivered the first. I don't want no trouble. Uh, my name is Upang Beto from Solidarity Ethiopia. Uh, I really thought that uh, brother Bill, you put it very well. I think one of the things that our community sometimes is seeing in South Africa, the one who don't look like us, but we also have an ethnic apartheid going on in the country. The talk I was listening more is about South Africa, but what about the Africa as a well? whole? I think this is something that we're missing. You mentioned the Rwandans. There's many conflicts going on throughout the continent. My question is, you know, the legacy of Mandela should not be only for the South Africa. It should be for Africa, even Central in America, even all of us who are here. So I think one of the things which is all the way I to be a problem is Dr. King and Mark Marx, when they were alive, they tried to build a bridge between us. 
And when those two gentlemen died, the bridge was broken, and the bridge has been broken for too long. What is it that can we do? As African American, as well as African, whether our grandfather came here 200 years ago, whether we come here today, we are all African American. Is there any way that we can really build this bridge and make sure that Africa, the African American warrior, can go back, the Jew went back, instead of Chinese going to go and grab the African land? Is this something we can do? <laughs> Oh, no, not this troublemaker. <laughs> Hi, my name is Phyllis Dennis. My question is about the movement here. And one of the extraordinary things that we had the advantage of in the anti-apartheid years was the fact that the ANC's multi-part strategy included a role for international solidarity. And we got leadership from that. So the question of the primacy of focusing on the banks, the primacy of divestment. This wasn't just something created here. It was something that was part of a broader strategy of the ANC. Something I should note that we in the Palestine Solidarity Movement don't have a strategy from a governing agency within Palestine. But I think the question that we now have is how do we rebuild a strategy when there isn't that kind of unified, the Freedom Charter, the search for one person, one vote, etc that motivated a movement here that involved certainly African Americans at its core, but was a multiracial movement as well. What do we do now when there's the divisions that we've been hearing about within the ANC, within the Communist Party, within Kosatu? In all of those arenas, there's this set of divides now. How do we build a movement here, a solidarity movement, that recognizes that when we don't have that unified strategic understanding that came from South Africa in those days. Okay, first round, a number of very, very provocative questions that I, and I think we begin with. And every panelist will not be able to address every question, by the way. We'll be here forever. But uh, the first question was around the role of Winnie Mandela, and I hope someone up here kept a record of the other questions because I was too busy trying to play whatever in the audience. So let's uh, have that. Who wants to talk about the role of uh, Winnie Mandela to develop? Well, I think that um, Winnie Mandela has her own legacy. Uh, you know, this was not a time to focus on her legacy because it really was about the passing away of Mandela. Uh, and it was hard enough to try to focus on the collective aspect of his image as opposed to simply him as an individual. Uh, I think that, you know, there are many lessons to learn from what happened to Winnie Mandela. First of all, I just want people to remember that she was isolated in the formative years of her adulthood uh, in that she was um, under house arrest. And in many ways, she didn't even have a girlfriend. In many ways, she didn't. She had uh, women who would come see her in solidarity, right, uh, Helen Schultzman. But she didn't have a sustaining um, collective support system in her life. And so I think that she was obviously a very courageous person uh, to go up against the system almost as an end of one. Um, she did have the ANC, of course, she had people in the ANC who supported her, and she had people who were against her, very much against her. And so nothing about her life was um, easy going in a sunny brook. And you know, it was no staircase <laughs> to the stars. You know? I mean, it really was not. And so it's in that context, I certainly very much respect her. And she um, uh, played a very important role during the time when uh, Mandela was in prison. Uh, she kept the family going her children, um, she, in that transition moment um, when she was a part of the delegation visiting here, uh, she was, you know, played a very key spokesperson role. Um, she is um, a very smart woman. I mean, I saw her, you know, speak extemporaneously and with very uh, cogent analytical thought. And so, I think that um, 
the personal is personal, and there is nothing for me to say about it <laughs> because it's not political in this context. And I am very glad that Mr. Mandela had 23 years to find some form of happiness and that we pay the small part of that I am exceedingly happy because just to see him play with his grandchildren in bed, have a pillow fight, was a delight. You know, and to see him giggle with his uh, great grandchildren he hadn't seen. And so that, you know, those were joys that he had in the midst of coming to the United States and knowing that if he made one mistake, it might derail the transition process for him to become president or there to be a black president. Did anyone else on there? Yeah, you know. And let's be a little more succinct. More succinct. Oh, it's hard. But um, I'm Winnie. I think, you know, first of all, it's important for us to, to understand her own agency and activism. You know, she, um, and, I, and I want to recommend if people haven't listened, um, uh, we mentioned Sandy's, Sandy, Sandy Reddit's interviews of, of Winnie Mandela. They're on the Pacifica Archive. Google it, look for it, get it, listen. Because I think it's a powerful understanding of the woman on a personal level as well as on a political level. But I think we have to remember she was a social worker, right? Um, when she met Nelson Mandela, she was a social and educated woman. Um, sorry? She was young, right? But, but, but she, was, she was an educated woman, but she saw her role as part of a movement, as part of a community, as part of a collective, and she continued to play that role. People talk about how you know social services were being run out of her house, essentially, to make sure that people were able to get textbooks for their kids or, or clothing for their children or food on the table. Those basic social services, she was doing that. But she was also very much, I believe, an activist. Uh, um, you know, who was not willing to compromise. I think we've got to be clear that, that you know, she, she, is, she is almost, yeah, I think clearly, sorry? Well, all right, we, we, can, we, can, we can debate that, right? But I think it's important to, to, to understand that, that she, was, she was one of those saying, we've got to hold on to all of our strategies. Let's not compromise too soon. Let's not give in to the grand bargain, perhaps, right? We can debate all of that. But the point is, she recognized the importance of, and, uh, you know, and by any means necessary, right, and, 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 and use that. So clearly we can talk about, you know, um, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, found Willie Mandela culpable, uh, you know, uh, violence, not some black violence, that's a reality, right, of those who were seen as conspirators to the white rulers and, you know, the apartheid regime, the necklacing and, and all of that is a very dark part of the history. But I, the lesson I got from that, really, is that this is an incredibly courageous, fearless uh, woman who was able to sustain a, a, a movement that used multiple strategies and was able to, to kind of hold on to that vision to continue to struggle for particularly those at the bottom. And I think it is why you still have young people who, you know, mama, mama wouldn't be a winning, who, you know, who still embrace her till this day and want to, um, you know, to, to, to make sure that that's all carried forward. But I think, yeah, clearly she was a minister in the government. There are other things that we can talk about, um, and hopefully we'll have another opportunity to just have more time on this, because I think it's important. Yeah, I think the next, um, I, I, and I, I was more taking the questions than that, and I hope that you were writing them down. I know there was a question that wanted some amplification, I think. So, why could I kind of... About the linkages that are... Uh, are my, there, were, there were several questions, you know. Well, let's, let, well, let's someone else that answer that one. <laughs> Bill? <laughs> Suggestions for solidarity. Um, I want to preface it by just saying something I think we have to re remember is that uh, social movements are presented the circumstances that they were designed. And that sometimes means that you have to look at the situation, you might have thought that it would play out differently, then it plays out. Like, like one side has tactical nuclear weapons and you don't. Uh, 
you know, things like that. And I think that's something that has to be factored in when we're talking about what led up to the certain decisions that were made. In, in terms of the issue of solidarity, this is something I obsess on. Um, and because, because we got a problem. And I'll give you an example. The last remaining colony in Africa is the Western Sahara, occupied by Morocco. There's been a war going on since, on and off since the 1970s. Now, the, the demand there is fairly clear. The Moroccans need to get out of Western Sahara and people need to have self-determination. It's very, very clear. So you can build solidarity around that. Now, the problem is, what happens when the colonizer is gone? I don't mean the Western Sahara, just in general. And, and that's when the issues of solidarity become much more complicated. Because it's not simply, let us unite with the people of country X against country Y. It's, how do we unite with the workers in a particular country against the, uh, the government or the capitalists in that same country who may look exactly the same, right? And they may look like us. How do we unite with the women in a particular country who are carrying on struggles against various kinds of misogynist politics? How do we engage in solidarity with people that are fighting around environmental justice when the leaders of a particular country wave the flag of nationalism and, and use that in, in order to crush those movements? The issue of solidarity is fundamentally different than anything that we that are baby boomers or older grew up with. And that's a challenge. And, and I, don't think, I don't think that there is a very clear answer. Because I think this is something that's going to be playing out. That we're going to have to identify, and, and this is not sexy, right? And I use that term explicitly. When I was running Trans Africa, and I'm not giving away the sword, but two of my board members said, Bill, you've got to come to us with a sexy issue. I said, what's sexy? They said, well, like the anti-apartheid movement. I said, what do you mean? It took 40 years to get there, right? I said, no, no, it doesn't matter. It needs to be a sexy issue. Folks, let me disabuse you. There are no sexy issues. Every issue is going to have to be built. We're going to have to build from scratch. And when we're building uh, uh, solidarity with the workers in South Africa, when the employers are, in many cases, black, look at Cyril Ramaphosa, it, 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 you can't do that through the prism of race alone. You have to expand, you have to understand that we're dealing with different dynamics and it necessitates different kinds of organizations. So part of what I think we have to do right now is a profound educational task of taking these issues very broadly and talking particularly with younger folks. Because see, in a lot of ways, a lot of younger folks can identify with this, to this international problem. Because those of us that were baby boomers, we saw the enemy. The enemy was Jim Crow segregation, Bull Connor, George Wallace. It was a very, very obvious enemy. The younger generation, they don't see that, right? The enemy often looks like us. The enemy often is sitting up 30 stories up behind polarized uh, windows, polarized glass. It's not that clear. I think that they can actually get it a lot easier than many of us from my generation. You know, one of the things I think we've got to do is, is do a whole series of forums on what is solidarity, uh, both historically and, and how is it different from now. Uh, one of the things about the African National Congress during that period is that they had operatives here. We had deep, there were, there were different dimensions of solidarity. And some of it was very, very deep solidarity where people kept in communication with activists on the ground there talking about strategic things, not just how you do some general anti-apartheid stuff. The African National Congress uh, operatives here spent a lot of time with individuals. Um, and so I'm not sure what we think we mean by solidarity. In the present moment, it means in the negotiation of power that is going on in South Africa right now, we have to make contact with what we see as the most progressive elements there. And then what do you mean by the most progressive there? That can't be a textbook, uh, personal kind of vantage point. It's actually how are things being negotiated. It may not be my utopian ideal of what it is, but you have to look at what is the leading edge, the most progressive development of the struggle. So when this, when this strike comes down in February, and the vice president of the African National Union, former communist, trade unionist, 
towering individual in the anti-apartheid movement, Ramaphosa, who is on the board of the Marikani Mining Company. And it is, he has not said that this didn't happen. It was reported that when the mining company called and said, you know, we've got to do something about this, whatever, wildcats, or however they want to describe them, what did he say? Call the police. So that's the real negotiation of power going on. And then we have to, in terms of deep solidarity, study that. It seems to me that another really easy thing to do, but it's complicated that we have to do, whether it's Morocco. You know, nothing stops us from going to the South African embassy weekly and raising these questions in demonstration. That is not a personal affront, should not be seen as a personal affront to whom I think is a wonderful progressive ambassador. He understands the complexities of the negotiation of politics. That's something that we could easily do to start to bring attention, which will bring attention there. Let me just hit one other thing. One of the other issues about South Africa and the African National Congress is the exportation of their model across the continent of Africa. You go into Mozambique, Angola, all of these places, South African companies are all over the place. So that model is being exported. I saw young people in Angola. I was in Angola several days last week. Young people are buying toenails, fingernails, colored, springing haircuts. I could have been in Washington, D.C., Northwest, or New York City. So we have some real investigation to do again of where are the progressives on the ground. So I do hope that we will hold some forums just on what are some of the lessons to extract from the dimensions of solidarity that we took on, and what are the implications for today. But again, these embassy issues of going to Morocco or the Israeli embassy, remember that Mandela and the African National Congress, and the African National Congress today takes a very hard, explicit line against apartheid in Israel. We have one of the representatives of the Association of American Studies here in the audience tonight, who just a few weeks ago passed a resolution dealing with the Israeli embassy. There are others beginning to take that up. That's one of the legacies of the anti-apartheid movement. It is one of the legacies of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela went to his grave holding that same position, that what is going on in Israel today. So that's an extension of that struggle that we should all take. Let me just ask a question, because I tend to be, you know, because one of the things that was talked about is the degree to which, because there's a question about leverage is one thing. We had leverage back in the day, because we could get investments withdrawn, all those kind of things. Now, there are a couple of leverage points that seem to be now. One is the fact that we have a growing continental African community that's in our midst. If somebody asks, that's a question we need to address, too. How do we build those kinds of relationships? And before we end, I would talk about what we're doing with IBW, because we've been working on a model in New York for about the last four years. But it might be, as a practical matter, as we're thinking out loud, given the strength that's pending, or maybe in some future day, might we try to find a way to pull some resources to bring someone like that for a national tour? Maybe labor would be involved. Maybe, you see what I'm saying? Those kinds of ideas, because that helps. Because in those days, we had those kinds of relationships. This is a way to begin to build those relationships, by bringing those folks here, and maybe having a chain of cities where we can have some forum. So I just wanted to lay that as a concrete possibility that we might work on. Well, I was just going to say, for 2014 for TransAfrica, that is actually one of the things that we are talking about, inspired by the Mandela tour of the eight cities over 10 days. Because for us, and this is the point that I wanted to make, because I think a lot of important points have been made about solidarity. And I appreciated Bill's point about young people. I mean, listen, here's the thing that I'm seeing. And I think that this is one of the things that, as African Americans and first, second generation Africans, we're going to have to deal with. The example I'm going to give, and some of you may feel that it's extreme. You know, listen, some of the most progressive forces on the continent of Africa are fighting for LGBT rights. Many of us, they come to the United States. They come, they are expressing progressive values. 
We don't want them in our church. We don't want to hear what they have to say. We think, well, that's just one of those, you know, extra kind of, let's deal with racism. Let's deal with even class. But we're not ready to deal with those issues. I would say today, the generation of young people who are growing up today, they grew up fighting on those different issues, are ready for that. Those are the issues that they're looking at. They're seeing solidarity. They're seeing relationship. They're not necessarily seeing friendship. Because one of the things that I've learned from hanging out with Sylvia is that, and I hope I'm not giving away the store, but the Free South Africa movement did not always agree with the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. They took leadership, like Phyllis said. But that doesn't mean there wasn't vigorous debate. That didn't mean there had, didn't have to be some conversation. That didn't mean that people kind of shifted in their chairs when they didn't necessarily agree with a political point of view. We need to be challenged. We need to challenge ourselves. You are not in solidarity. You are not in coalition if you are comfortable. You're just hanging out with your folks. That's what that is. That's hanging out with your folks. In order to make real change, because listen, this is one of the things that I'm learning more and more about these conservative coalitions. They don't actually like each other. But they realize that if they work together, these folks that just care about corporatism but don't like the religious right, they realize that there's power there. Talk about leverage. That's one of the broadest coalitions that our country has ever seen. We have to do a little bit more of that. I'm not suggesting that we, we give up our principles. But what I am saying is we give up being comfortable. And what makes what made the last generation comfortable, the anti-apartheid generation comfortable, is certainly different than what makes maybe the newer generation comfortable, but we all have to do it. We all have to be willing to go out of that comfort zone. Because if not, again, it really isn't solidarity. I want to get just two more questions from the audience. I recognize two people. There was a number over here that I bypassed the first time. Yes, right here. And then I'm coming to you, and then we're going to get the concluding um, statements out. Yes, sir. that Mandela's legacy was manufactured uh, based on the fact that uh, even imperialists and many other people, uh, some among his victimizers, were celebrating him? That's the question. A great question. That I... My name is Michael Byfield. I'm um, concerned about, and my question has to do with capitalism and South Africa, and two, two other issues that I want to bring up and you can talk about it if you have the time, which is xenophobia, uh, which is the victimization of a lot of immigrants, particularly Nigeria, Nigerian, and uh, Desmond Tutu making a recommendation that South Africa ought to open its borders to all immigrants and transform the country. Okay, so we this is the last round, so... I just want to say the quick thing about the um, COVID. You know, whenever there is a figure based on people popularity, the forces of... Uh, the power forces will try to co-opt it. And so that was what that was about. You know, they saw that they could not destroy him as such his image so what do you do you co-opt it and try to incorporate it and he did he stood by his principles and the way you counteract that is through the kind of organizing that we're doing it's going to always happen it happens in every movement such. okay who else wants to pick up there was also a question about I think building linkages and relationships to the what I call the, the growing uh, and very diverse new African community. By that I mean we now have 50,000 Nigerians in Houston, Texas. I mean phenomenon. You can get some jerk chicken in Jackson, Mississippi now. I mean we've got a whole new phenomenon going on here, and that was discussed uh, as well. So who who's who's next? Uh, just just quickly on on the issue of, of how uh, people have praised Mandela. I actually have found nothing that I disagree with about how Mandela has been praised. 
that his elements of truth have been brought and erased. He was an extraordinary individual. It's the narrative. It's the absence of a narrative that really is the problem. I think he is all of the things that I have seen in the bourgeois press. You know, he was one who dealt with reconciliation. He was a man of discipline. He was a man of peace. He was a man of in, in, in integrity. He galvanized the interests of the entire world. Though all of those elements are true, but if they're just left out there as the narrative, then we are being diverted away from the social Mandela. Um, Trent Africa pointed out, I pointed out in an article I did for the Smithsonian, first of all, Mandela was always a social individual because he came from tradition. He came from collective living. And he used that traditional optic to deal with the contemporary world. Uh, when the struggle was, the bloody struggle was going on with, with the Encarta Freedom Party in Bukalese, Mandela called for a traditional role of diplomacy called uh, the Mbizu, uh, where you recognize the eldest call. He was taking tradition and putting that in the middle of diplomacy. When he and Winnie Mandela were going through a divorce and she called for a tradition to have the eldest settle that, his public response is that I'm not a tribalist. Now that sounds like a contradiction. On the one hand, he calls for the Ambiso for a social national mediation, but at the level of personal engagement, he says, no, we cannot put that in the public space as a, as a kind of national issue. This is an issue between me and uh, you. On, um, I just came out of Angola where we were commemorating Queen and Zinga, the 350 years of Queen and Zinga, particularly her issues of diplomacy and 100 years of Amy Césaire, in which I went back and I looked at his discourse on uh, colonialism. And I urge you, just go online. Robin Kelly has a wonderful introduction to that. And it's a very readable piece. You can go online for Mother Read Dress and Pick Up. And this, this speaks to the issue of capitalism. And one of the things I said to them there, because Amy Césaire left the Communist Party when they invaded, I think, um, Hungary or someplace. And, and I said, you know, the question of the Communist Party, that title is not, like, not really the issue. The question is, why was he seeking an alternative to the system called capitalism? That same question is before us today. When we see all of the results are, are the, the impoverishment of masses of people, uh, now we have been forced, given the actual negotiation of power here in the U.S., to begin to talk about something that everybody up on this panel and probably all of you have always talked about. The index for us has never been the middle class. The index of democracy for us has always been the poorest, marginalized people. Uh, um, so that, that, that this is something that we have to consider. This export of democracy, uh, this is the new civilizing factor that the West was trying to do when Senghor was dealing with uh, Europe, having no answers. This system has no answers. What's going on in Latin America and the Caribbean? From left to right, every country in Latin America and the Caribbean are now integrated into the new community of Latin America and Caribbean nations because, as Hugo Chavez pointed out to them, we have mutual material interests. Let's not spend a lot of time arguing what, what kind of socialist I am or what kind of liberal capitalist you are. Let's put Argentina, the breadbasket of the world, with uh, Brazil, the third largest petroleum reserve in the world, with Venezuela, the first largest petroleum in the world. Let's feed our people. Uh, let's do things. And the, the ideological debates will come, al will, uh, come along. Last point for me is on uh, the new African. Since 1969, 60, 62, I think it was, uh, Immigration Act that admitted more non-European or more non-white people to the US. More Africans have come to this country than were brought during the entire period of the enslavement of Africans here, which was less than 500,000 during the period of slavery. We look like one another. We suffer racism in a broad sense like one another. But the real question is ideological and political, or ethical and political. What are our values? Uh, I have a, in my files coming out of the organizing around the, the first global summit of the African diaspora, which took place about a year and a half ago uh, in South Africa. Uh, a note from some African brothers who are not immigrants, they are citizens, that's the other thing, they recognize that many of these are citizens who say that 
you, James Earl, it was very respectful, and the generational group that you represent, uh, the descendants of the European Atlantic slave trade, you are not the real diaspora. The real diaspora are those of us who are sending home these uh, uh, billions of dollars in uh, uh, remittances. Now, there are other Africans who say, you, James Early, and the generational cohort that you represent, we are brothers and sisters because we share the same kinds of human values about progress. So this is the issue Bill has been emphasizing, and I think we all have been emphasizing in many ways. This abstract notion that we are just back, or the abstract notion, we've seen this whole thing about bourgeois feminism. Oh, we have a woman who is going to be president of this. That is an important bourgeois democratic advance. But that does not is not a necessary signal that we're going to see systemic transformation. It seems that we should be able, or we have a man in the White House who didn't take a team with him. We should be able to learn this lesson. So we, those of us, uh, Afro descendants, a term invented in uh, 2000 in Chile when black people from across the continent came together in preparation to go to the World Conference Against Racism. To say that we were just African did not give us a pride because we were speaking English and Spanish and Creole and we were Catholics and, and atheists and traditional African and stuff. So we needed a terminology. Afro-descendant emerged as a political project. And so in this political project, we African descendants need to find one another based on ethics, not on skin color, and not make assumptions that just because we have a relationship to Africa, we have the same vantage point about it. Um, so first I want to thank uh, Ron for, um, for organizing this, and, and Don for organizing this. The um, two, two points, I think. One is that um, it, in the beginning, I don't know what I'm supposed to say this, but in the beginning of State and Revolution by Lenin, remember that guy? Uh, he said one of the things, uh, that white guy, right? Um, he did a few things. Anyway, uh, one of the things he points out, and it's really interesting, I'm trying to figure out why it was in the beginning of that, is that any time a hero of the press dies, the ruling class always takes that. The, the legacy and twist it against the interests of the oppressed. And I think we have to always keep that in mind. We've seen that with uh, King, with, uh, with Malcolm, with Rosa Parks, a variety of people. We're seeing, we saw it the moment that Mandela died. And in fact, some people would argue even before he died. That the, that the enemy of progress attempts to twist the legacy for their own interests. Now, we have to be very careful. One is that that means that we have to fight a constant battle around history. A constant battle around history, defining history. And we're always at war with the other side around history, around our, uh, uh, our, the legacies of our leaders and of our struggles. But it also means that we should not fall prey to myth making, which is the other problem where you, you identify an individual as so great that they're impervious to criticism and that it's impossible to talk about them because there was a short distance between God's mouth and their ear and it doesn't work that way. It never does, it never will. And, and when we're looking at Mandela and Mandela's legacy, you know, right now it's too raw. We can't get into the discussion of what we're going to have to at some point. At some point we have to have a real examination of 1994 to 1999 and what happened in South Africa. And it's going to be a very difficult, very painful discussion, but it's a necessary one, right? Because we're not, none of these people are demigods, they're not saints. There were decisions made and we can disagree and we can also agree, so that, that's one thing. The second thing is um, that, that, that there really are, to build on what James is saying, there are these two diasporas. And, and those of us that are the descendants that are the descendants of the slave trade, uh, we, we get very upset when we're disregarded, like the way the African Union did in the beginning, basically ignoring us, saying that the only diaspora were people that migrated. You know, I think that there were a number of us that wanted to jump on a plane to go to Addis Ababa and to explain to them that it didn't quite work out that way. 
Um, and I think it's very, very important to build on what James is saying, that, that, that these two diasporas are very important. They have their own specificities. But ours, those of us that are the descendants of the slave trade, are just as legitimate members of the diaspora as those that came here voluntarily. And that is something around which we should be prepared to fight. I am serious. This is not something to let go by. It is fundamentally important in terms of history. And, and when we look at the, <laughs> when we, when we the Pan-African movement, it was, it was people from that diaspora, like Du Bois and others that were central, people out of the Caribbean who were central you know, uh, in, 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 in really building that, that Pan-African movement. We can never forget that. Right? Yeah, and, yeah. and finally, in terms of this issue of xenophobia and, and borders, that's a I'm, I'm going to really take a pass on that one. That's a, that's a discussion that the people in South Africa are going to have to resolve. But, but one of the things that that's going to have to look at at some point is that the continent really will have to relook at borders. That's right. Really look at the borders. The inheritance of the borders from the colonial period have left us with a legacy. If you want any further questions, look at the South Sudan. Right? There's much more that has to be said about that. Amira and Adan, I'll give you the last word and I'll make some concluding remarks. Well, Bill, thank IGW. I guess I just want to thank this audience. You all, my mom said, how many people do you expect? I said, well, it's Friday night. <laughs> Before the holidays, it's like <laughs> <laughs> kind of organized, you know, we're in the midst of a lot. So I just want to thank you all for carving out time, for being here, for your thoughtful questions, comments, and, and all your contributions as part of this movement. I guess I, 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 I tend to, you know, I, I tend to be kind of on the hopeful end in terms of where things are going. Maybe it's my nature. Um, but I feel like the parents in the room, those who especially brought their children out here tonight. <laughs> Thank you for that. You know, give it up for them. Give it up for them. I feel like a lot rests on us remembering, right? Making sure that our history is told, the history of these movements, the history of our people, the history of battleism, the history of agency. So I feel like the responsibility is especially on the parents to teach the children in so many ways. It can be the storytelling, it can be you know, the actors and actresses in the room, <laughs> through the culture and the arts, um, but there's so many ways in which um, our stories have to be told, are being told. Um, and, and I think we have to continue to find new ways to tell those stories. I'm really heartened by the technologists, I know some of them in the room, <laughs> folks who are building, using technology, to, you know, claiming an Africanist ideals as they use technology to build the world of the 21st century. I find a lot of hope in that. Right? It is, you know, young people using tools, using culture, using new ways of organizing, of being, of, of expressing. Um, activism of expressing agency that I think um, gives hope not only for, for South Africa and, 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 but, but for all of, of, of the world. Um, so I actually am heartened that the board freers were born after 94, a lot of them And I think they have been um, educated, politicized in a different way. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that combination of workers and young people and culture artists, you know, musicians and poets and all of that, I'm hopeful that that brings a new radicalism, a new solidarity movement that cuts across those borders and those boundaries and that um, has a vision of, of really a people with dignity wherever they are in the world, wherever they are on the planet, that identify with Africa, you know, that they are able to find power to gain strength to keep moving forward. So yeah, it's hard to do this in a quick way, but I guess I just want to thank all those who have laid the groundwork 
to thank all the movement leaders in this room. You know, we didn't mention Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the genocide of today is happening. Movement leaders in this room are clamoring for greater solidarity today and into the future. We've got to hold them up, hold each other up, and keep fighting and struggling. And most importantly, remember, you know, I think it's Sylvia who said it, movements take time. Let's go to Michelle. I mean, I'm sorry. No, Always call me Michelle for years. years. <laughs> Nicole, first. Uh, I just want to also um, thank you for putting this together and raise that if I've heard from so many people how affirming the Free South Africa movement was to just be a part of. It affirmed our humanity here in the United States. And I think sometimes we forget that while there was sacrifice on this side and a lot of work, it also um, really solidified our role in, in that history, which I think is just very important. You know, being a mom too, I think about, you know, how do we teach this next generation? It's something in Trans Africa we've spent um, a lot of time on. And, you know, one of the things I, I, I keep thinking about is how we can talk about he was not perfect, he was not a saint, which is the beauty because we can all do these amazing, make these amazing moves like Nelson Mandela did. So what are those Mandela moments? And it's not, it's not just about the Congo. It is, but it, but it isn't. Um, it's about Moral Mondays here in North Carolina. It's about getting involved with that. It's about making sure that as we try to form these more perfect unions or assist forming these more perfect unions around the world, what are we doing about our own? And how are we making sure that we're living up to these ideals? Um, immigration, I totally agree with Bill about fighting for the position of the diaspora, but as we fight, we need to fight along our sisters and brothers who are first and second generation immigrants whose children are picked up by the police and, and abused but then also deported. We don't, we don't like to talk about that sometimes because we don't, we don't experience that. But that, that, is, I mean, that is a front we must be on as, as traditional African Americans that are you know, generations away from slavery. We must, must, we must. We must be there as well. If not, our solidarity is imperfect as well. Thank you. John Rojas. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ron. I'll be brief. I just want to sort of address my final comments to the young people in the audience, and I see there are quite, quite a few of them. And I'm assuming that they're all sort of activists at, at one level or one uh, persuasion or another. Uh, for those aging activists like ourselves, <laughs> with the exception of, <laughs> of the two ladies there, but uh, those of us who've been around the block a few times and have been uh, involved in various struggles over, over decades, uh, one of the things we used to do back in the day uh, was um, uh, not only uh, collective action on the barricades in the streets, we'd also do collective study. It was important for us to study, to get together, put aside time, uh, to study the lessons of history, to study uh, the context of our struggle, because we would never learn those uh, in, in classroom. They won't teach that kind of stuff in the classroom. To, 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 to learn what the uh, uh, not, not as the contributions of the great towering personalities of history like the Nelson Mandela's, but also to study the structures, the systems, uh, uh, the political and economic systems within which these great figures emerge. And there are lots of his, uh, important historical lessons in that, kind, in that kind of study. So I would urge the young activists uh, who are going to be involved in the next iteration of, of the Occupy movement uh, who will be on the barricades, also take some time out for conscious collective study. And one of the lessons that I think, one of the historical le lessons that, uh, that can be extracted from the South African, uh, recent South African historical experience, uh, is something that we also, uh, when we were in Grenada uh, in, um, during the revolution from 1970 to 1983, we were also very conscious and aware of this. And that is this. You know, there's a this, this, it's a far cry from fighting in the streets as revolutionaries uh, to governing in the streets and remaining revolutionaries, <laughs> right? Uh, you, you know, uh, this tendency has been not only in South Africa, but in, in some of the other frontline states in Southern Africa as well, and, and, and other parts of, of, uh, of the world, 
that have gone through liberation struggles, have won liberation struggles at great, great cost, but once in power, uh, the challenges of maintaining not only their revolutionary principles once, once they are in power, but also uh, not demobilizing and, and, and ignoring the necessity to continuously organize the masses after, the, after, after power has been won. Uh, because a revolutionary movement will, not, will, will never be able to make the transformations that are necessary to, to, to guarantee the ultimate figure of the revolution if you systematically demobilize the masses uh, who, who, who brought the revolution about. If you lose faith in, 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 in the masses themselves. I've seen this happen so many times uh, in, in recent years. So uh, that, that I think is, a, is one of the, the lessons of history that I would uh, advise um, and suggest to the young activists in the audience that they, that they think about and study. Thank you. I would feel so remiss that I, know I want to just pick up on a point. You know, in many ways, this was a struggle of the people uh, to really grapple with how do you assume state power. And now we're in the phase of what you do with it, you know, <laughs> how do you figure it out. But I just want to acknowledge Cuba's role, uh, particularly the Vince Ramos Brigade. Because many of the activists who were part of the collective I was in went and served in the Ladies Brigade. Uh, and that was a group that, in solidarity, would go to Cuba and build houses and participate in um, all kinds of nation building activities. But what that gave us was a vision that you could actually have a different kind of society. And so I don't want us to forget the notion of hope, which was also one of the legacies of Mandela. And you know, if you read, talk to the people who were in Robins Island with him, he never did not have hope. He lived his life in prison as if one day he would be free and that he would assume state power. <laughs> and so I think we have to always have that vision that we can make a better society and that we can assume a role where we can make a better society. Thank you. Okay. Well, Dr. Sylvia Neal, Emira Woods, Bill Fletcher, Nicole Lee, Attorney Nicole Lee, James Early, and Don Rojas, our panel. Give them a rousing round of applause. Give them a good panel. Give them a good panel. We also want to give another shout out to Andy Shalal and Bus Boys and Poets for hosting us. Again, thanks to WPFW and WOL, uh, Carl Nelson Show in particular, for helping us get the word out. Now, I'm also going to ask you, because we did a band organizing job, my wife and partner gave me some cards that I was supposed to bring so we could get some information because we're trying to build up our database. And I said, why am I dragging my briefcase behind? I left and I left my little cards at the hotel and she's going to kill me for being a bad organizer. But you can go to our website www.ibw21.org www.ibw21.org and you can sign up for the newsletter so that you can be a part of getting the information. And by the way, I must say that under the leadership of Don Rojas, we now have an incredibly bumping website. I mean, this is kind of a tremendous website. Let me conclude by saying this. This was hosted by the Institute of the Black World 21st Century on a collaborative basis. Because that's what we do in terms of this iteration of IBW. And you all know that there was once another IBW. We have picked up on that tradition, hopefully, and are going into the 21st century, hence the name IBW 21st century. We are particularly eager to brand ourselves and to be to live up to the legacy of the first IBW in terms of these quality kinds of conversations. That's what IBW was known for. Convenings, research, and so forth. We have a slightly larger mission, but we don't want to neglect this one. These very quality kinds of conversations. And we do it on a collaborative basis because that's what we think is important, that no one institution has the capacity to do all the things that need to be done. That we need to talk about specialization in the division of labor. And that's one of the things that we promote in terms of our work, is how can we work together to advance certain aims. 
I want to reference the fact that I also feel vindicated by this conversation, because I don't, I've never considered myself a great theorist. You know, I've always hung around with the James Earlys of the world and the great theoretical minds and ideologues who know stuff. I'm just, I'm just out of Youngstown, Ohio, a little steel town, and I don't know too much about these things. But my impulse some time ago was just read a little Cabral, a little Fignon, that much. And they talked about things like national liberation and national reconstruction. Stuck with me. The national liberation is about you achieve state power. Well, Fagnon and Gibral said the next stage, and Nkrumah had something to say about that too, was the total decolonization and liberation of the productive forces so that in fact those forces would be used for the masses of the people. That that was the real aim of the revolution. It wasn't like we have here. We have the same thing here. We get Negroes elected to office as if that was the objective. That was never the objective coming out of the black liberation struggle. Our goal was, in fact, we elected black people. Their first responsibility was to point out the contradictions and hypocrisy of the system and the fact that it utterly, under a capitalist political economy, could never deliver for the masses of the people. That's what we want to talk about. He said, all right, and so you, so you must get in there, and you must share this information, but you must also strain the system while you're there on a practical basis to get as many resources for the masses of people as you can, and then you must create structures of accountability. That was kind of a vision, which has largely been lost, except for a few folks. So we've gone through, as you said, Bill, we've gone through our own struggles here. So this thing has been troubling me, and that's why we can be this national, international conference on the future of democracy and development in Africa and the Caribbean. To begin to have these studies, these, these conversations about where are we now. And I heard a lot of that coming through today in terms of the fact that it was, it's not about skin color. It's not about, about just having some black people in government. It's not about being in Nigeria, one of the richest oil nations in the world, and you have the, the, uh, the, the Delta where people are, are starving and suffering in the middle of all this oil. Well, Nigeria, not maybe I should just speak of Nigeria, but many other places where you have all of these, this class, really, of, of, of people who are in power, who are squandering the wealth in the middle of plenty. And then the question is our relationship to that as well. So I think this is a great conversation. I think these are the conversations you have, and I think if nothing else, we can contribute by what we write and what we say, because in today's, this global world, our expressions, a lot of times people historically have looked at this diaspora. And so if what we write and what we say and what we begin to, to articulate might in fact have some impact at that level as well. But there's another level we also need to take. And that is to talk about how do we build relationships between those Africans who are now in this new African community where you have increasing numbers of Haitians and Jamaicans and, 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 and Ethiopians. And D.C. not new. This is not new to D.C. But in many other places, this is a new phenomenon. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, when we, when we had our symposium, we learned that a whole, we, the, the people that, the, other, the, the, the first generation of the former, they, they didn't even know there was this growing group of Africans right there. But the good thing about it is, they began to make the connection. And in, in, in New York City, for the last four years, we have something called the Pan-African Unity Dialogue, which is predicated on the notion that we have to pull continental Africans together, Afro-Latinos together. Caribbean Americans together, and African Americans together, periodically to have these conversations, to share ideas, to talk about how we bridge divides, if there are divides, and sometimes there are divides. Because sometimes we say African Americans are saying the Caribbeans are coming to take our jobs. Sometimes there's resentment because indeed there's a feeling sometimes that people don't understand that the struggle, this black freedom struggle, paved the way for people to be here to have the opportunities they have. So there's sometimes still a sense of, well, you know, what's up with that? So we have to, because at the end of the day, it is about global black power in a righteous sense. So when I use black, I don't use it in the cosmetic sense. When I say global black power, I'm talking about it in the progressive sense that talks and takes into account the questions of race and class. So we've been doing these meetings. We meet every three months, and we have two hours. We sit around the table and we share information. And first of all, it was just dialogue. And we finally decided we could work on the 2010 census together. Most recently, we've been, and we dealt with the issues of the NYPD and the FBI invading Muslim mosques because we have the imams are African and African-American imams. And most recently, we've also been dealing with the question of an immigration reform bill because it ain't just about immigration. It's not a kumbaya exercise. 
I am for comprehensive immigration reform, but it must be just, fair, and inclusive of everybody. It cannot be a proposition where diversity pieces are cut out, so therefore fewer African people are allowed to come into this country. That, that's not how coalitions work. Coalitions are based on interests. Progressively, we sit down and talk it through and figure out how that can. So we, we've been working very much on that issue, dealing with the caucus, the Afrocentric caucus on the Hill, in terms of those issues. I know that here in Washington, D.C., Raleigh Kimbrough uh, at uh, Metropolitan uh, AME Church, and you came up, Raleigh, to our meeting. You saw it firsthand. Don, you came up and witnessed it firsthand. It's talking about having, creating a pan-African ministry in Metropolitan, because we have these like, our brothers and sisters in our midst but we have not connected them, and we're not connected with them in a way that can be effective. And that's one of the ways, by the way, when you talk about the engagement in terms of the struggle for democratic rights and social transformation here, as well as to begin to talk about how we also impact in their respective countries the kind of work that needs to be done. So again, we feel vindicated, we feel delighted that this conversation is taking place, we're glad that so many people, we hope, watch uh, this webcast as well, and we say, as we close, a Luther Continua. A Luther Continua. A Luther Continua. Thank you so much.